So I'll just like to add to that, Hearing Your Genes Evolve, a new work for String Quartet received its premiere at the London International String Quartet Festival in April 2013 in the performance space under the wooden hull of the 19th century Cuddy Sark Clipper, which had been elevated in dry dock in maritime Greenwich. This was an era of adventure, of innovation, an entrepreneurial world trade, an exchange of new ideas. The world was moving on, horizons were expanding. And there's a fitting coincidence at play here. The Cuddy Sark was built in 1869, the same year that entrepreneurial Swiss physician Friedrich Mischer isolated what we now know as nucleic acids, paving the way for the identification of DNA as the carrier of inheritance. Hearing Your Genes Evolve was the result of a year-long collaboration in 2012 between Dr. Sarah Teichman and myself at the MRC Laboratory in Cambridge, where I was the Leverhulme composer in residence. Sarah and I are continuing our collaborative work together now at the EBA and Sanger Institute in Cambridge, devising work based on specifics of protein building, which Sarah will talk about more in, in the talk, and exploring music applications, which can be used to explain and illustrate differences in genetic anomalies. We also believe that science, embracing music as a means to convey complex ideas will encourage public awareness and understanding in a meaningful and personal way for both science practitioner, audience member and composer. So what did it mean for me to be a composer in residence in one of the greatest genetic science laboratories in the world? Well, quite frankly, it was a bit of a culture shock. I'm used to working with big orchestral rehearsals. I just recently worked with the BBC Symphony Orchestra where you have 70 musicians pitching opinions and questions and they demand feedback immediately so that they can play your music better. I'm also used to the music conservatoire environment, which is vibrant and noisy, where people express themselves through playing and it's a live hive of activity. By contrast, the scientists in Sarah's team work with computer data, with laboratory samples and microscopes and it is all very silently focused and often quite individual work. And it must have been a bit of a shock for them also to encounter me. But after a couple of months, I had a eureka moment when one of the science team drew a graphic picture using strands of DNA from his work on the Thousand Genome Project, which opened a whole new thought process for me, and I saw clearly how I could translate this information into music. After a few months, I also noticed that my science colleagues were a lot more open about explaining their work and gave me information in a much more creative way, which I could understand and have a way into in order to begin writing the music. This imaginative dialogue that I was now having with the scientist was so refreshing, new and exciting, and I began to feel that I was also able to ask the right questions. I was beginning to know what to look for. So, Getting back to the premiere at the Cutty Sark, taking part in the pre-concert presentation dressed in colour code representations of two of the four genetic base codes are Maya and Ethan. Maya is Sarah's daughter and Ethan is my son. There they are to illustrate that although there are more than three million differences between your genome and anyone else's, on the other hand we are 99 0.9% the same, DNA-wise, that is. But I'm a composer. I work with variables and uncertainties. I'm free-thinking, and instinctively, my work is very fluidic. I'm not bound by rules, and I do not need to ever justify what I do. But I was drawn to this thing, DNA, with a passion for understanding it and what it means in our everyday lives how it functions and the implications for a long-term health and well-being. This desire to translate scientific data and DNA into musical language, a common universal language, representing and illustrating the four bass codes, seemed naturally to work through the four instruments found in the string quartet. Understanding Ethan's difference, he was born in 2006 with an extra set of chromosomes, trisomy 21, commonly known as Down syndrome. And this was an important catalyst to this specific work with Sarah at the MRC Laboratory in Cambridge. 
A central aim of our work together was to demystify the scientific principles behind genetics and make them more meaningful to a wider audience. I used fragments of DNA patterns from the Thousand Genome Project. I set about creating a number of musical dialogues between the four instruments in a string quartet, which represented variations in how the genetic code transforms and modifies as the components change. But how could we begin to do this? Sarah is now going to explain what we mean by the term SNP, S-N-P. So um, all of us, the, the, what, what makes us alive, just the way fruits and vegetables are alive, is genetic information. And that genetic information is encoded in our DNA. We have three billion bases that encode the information that makes us living organisms. And the alphabet in which that information is encoded is DNA. And the four letters in that alphabet are A, T, G, and C. The four bases, the four nucleotide bases. Um, adenine, A, thymine, T, guanosine, G, and cytosine, C. And we all share, whether we're men or women, wherever we come from in the world, we're about 99% identical to each other. But now and again, there are small variations in those three billion base pairs. And they are shown here. I don't know whether you can see the, the difference in color between the G and the C. Where did I put my pointer? Oh, yeah. So um, I'm sure you can see here that this is, this is um, a, a random piece of DNA. And you can see some people have the red and some people have the yellow. And it's these minuscule, tiny little changes that account for the differences, a lot of the differences between us. So you can see that Deidre and I look very similar, but actually there are some small differences that make us look different and maybe make her be able to compose a, an opera while I'm just uh, you know, s s typing at the computer all day. So um, um, these little variations are called single nucleotide polymorphisms, or SNPs for short. So they're polymorphisms variations and changes. So a computer printout of a single person's DNA is 200 pages long, so we've got 200 pages of this information. And that would have been a very long piece of music. So for this work we used, we worked from 20 pages. And this was the beginning of me getting information that I would then think, how do I, how do I translate that? How do I make it into music? And there are lots of areas of overlap between the DNA, the science principles behind DNA and music, to do with repetition, replacement of letters, as Sarah just talked about, switching material, and looking at cells as patterns. So what does our DNA tell us? How does it work? What does it mean? Sarah, can you tell us a little bit about DNA? So um, as I said, DNA is an alphabet that consists of four bases. And 50% um, of, of, of our DNA is uh, inherited from our, our mother and the other 50% from our father. And the unique combination of those two is what makes each of us an individual. As, as, as I'm sure you've heard the story of the double helix of DNA, the structure is double helical because the DNA is base pair and a ladder. And um, the... the um, yeah, the, 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 in, in, in humans, there are two copies because there's a maternal and the paternal chromosome and they're organized into 22 molecules or chromosomes. So let's look at DNA and the evolutionary part and there's a few surprising facts. We share 50% of the same DNA as a banana. But in the grand scheme of evolution, we have evolved as human beings with the knowledge that we eat the banana and it doesn't eat us. As Sarah said, we share 50% DNA from our mother and 50% from our fathers. And I represented this in the string quartet by having two defined different types of music pitted against each other so that the two instruments worked in pairs, so we got these forces against each other. So, I would like you to turn and look at the person next to you. Look meaningfully into their eyes. Look at the exact color. 
Are their eyes blue? Are they green? Brown? Grey? Go on, I can see lots of people not looking at each other. The exact colour of your eyes is predetermined by your genetic information. So, as you came in this evening, we hopefully, you received a colour card and people are wondering what it was and Sarah's just about to tell you because she's going to talk a little bit about genetic variation. So genes can encode for eye color. They can also code for eyelash length and curliness. So what is a gene? What does that word actually mean? Well, a gene is uh, like a word. It's basically a set of, of those letters, usually hundreds of the, of the A, T's, G's and C's in a particular combination. And that particular combination then codes for the gene product which makes the trait in the person. And so, so the way I want you to, to imagine this now is that each of you is one of the letters in the gene and your letter is determined by the card you have. So you should all have colored cards. Can you hold up your colored cards? Yay, it's worked. Okay, so we're going we're gonna to encode the gene by having a Mexican wave that runs from the right-hand side of the room in the front row to the left, and at the last person it runs back, and then it runs back and back and back. So I want you to do a Mexican wave, even if there are sort of disconnections, look for your neighbors, and go as quickly as you can, and go up and down for your, your each of you is a letter in the gene. So start here. Go. Up, stand up, stand up, come on, guys. Stand up, stand up, yay! Thank you, let's get yay. some energy That's into this good. Mexican That's wave. Good. To the left, to the left, here, you, okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay, that next one we have died. Okay. Somewhere around okay. three. Okay. Okay. We're, we're mathematical enough here that we can recognize the patterns, the differences between one row and the next row. So we're going to go, we're going to start again with you. Stand up. Everybody's going to stand up first. Okay. And okay, now go. along here. Let's go. Go. And back from the left. Yay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And back from the right. Back, yay, yeah, and back from the left. You in the middle, yeah, go, go, okay, okay, it's dying down. Okay, okay. This, is, this, is, this is a very short gene. This <laughs> short gene encodes for eyelash length and curliness through the combination of the four letters. But you probably saw when you were looking at your neighbor that there are variations. And, and as I said, those variations come in terms, in terms of replacements of the letters, mutations that are either inherited or arise spontaneously. And so what I'd like you two ladies to do is to swap your card. Stand up and hold up your card with the, the, the nice white bubbles. Yeah, and you, please, with the nice scarf. Hold up your card and then switch it. So now the gene encodes for something else. So the blue and the yellow are switched and that's going to have an impact on the gene product, and we'll see what those are later, thank you, and, and which can then impact the, the feature, let's say, eyelash length. So there's a knock-on effect of these mutations because the code has an impact on the gene products, which are the proteins, and we'll come on to those later. Okay, thank you for that. So going back to DNA and music, there is nothing about the DNA lettering that we saw earlier that has anything to do with music except three letters that you can of course think okay we've got an A, a C and a G and we are familiar with those letters in terms of, of Western scales and the T is, a, is very random there isn't a, a T letter in, in what we know as a musical scale so I had to invent that and that was great fun and that's part of what I do because that's my job I get to play with material and if I think about the DNA as almost like building blocks. If you're a child and you're building blocks and you build them up as tall as they can go, and one of the best things you can do is knock them down. And they become a new pattern and you rebuild it again. So that's similar to what happened in the piece, that a piece of genetic information built up, it fell down or it switched, and we, we built it again. So there's a certain amount of randomness, but there's a certain amount of patterning and repetition and things that are familiar and things that then become suddenly very arresting in the music because it switches. So we've had a pattern that happened and then there's a pattern that changes. So Sarah and I are going to briefly talk about what a cell means because the language of music and science 
we could be speaking of totally different languages. Sarah, from the science perspective, if you could just tell us a little bit about the cell. So this is an interesting story about communication. Because in biology, a cell is one of the units that builds up an organ or a tissue. So you can imagine a cell as one of the seeds in the sunflower, and then your brain is, for instance, made up of millions of cells. And each cell actually contains in it the complete genetic information of, of your, um, that you've inherited. Um, muscles uh, contain that genetic information just the way neurons do, but in muscles, different sets of genes are switched on relative to neurons. So the same genetic information is there in the, in, in the other type of cell, but it's a different set of genes that's actually expressed, that's actually switched on. And um, some of my research is very much related to how genes are switched on and off. And so, of course, it's those cells, those neurons communicating with each other that tell the muscles in your hand to, to, to wiggle their fingers. So I want all of you to wiggle your fingers and think about the neurons, the neuronal cells, and the muscles. Says, Yay. Yeah. So that, those are cells in biology. Now, a cell in music is, is not a scale, and it's something that I really specifically wanted to talk about because... Um, I wasn't making scales that are, are going across in lines that are familiar, but if you think about a sunflower head and you, and you put your hand in and grab a chunk of, of seeds from the top, well, if I call that a cell that represented the A base code. From the right, a cell that represented the T, C, and the G. So we don't just have four notes in the piece. We have groups of notes that form a cell that I've made into a clump so that, it, that they are just not linear, but they can be played four lines together. So I'm going to go back again to the, um, the SNP. Um, and that's what I began with. And I translated it over some time into a musical score. And this is the first page of the string quartet. And you can see the top line, A, C, A, C, C, A, C, 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 A, C, E flat. So that was a big, that's all part of that, that clump A. So, um, Sarah's just going to uh, show you a really lovely little um, video which um, was made by a science colleague in America. And um, this was very inspiring to me in terms of what I could do with rhythm because there's nothing to do with the letters that can tell us anything about rhythm. So Sarah, if you could just So these, say. this video represents the inside of a cell. And as I mentioned, basically the inside of a cell is full of the protein products. The proteins are the, are the gene products in other words, the, the, the translation of the genetic information into an actual three-dimensional structure that's the active substance and catalyzes reactions and plays structural roles inside the cell. And here you can see the, the importance of proteins interacting with each other. So the genes don't act on their own. They interact in, by physically binding to each other in combinations of these beautiful protein complexes that have a lot of symmetry. So you can see here five copies of the same thing. And, and they form huge machines, such as the ribosome over here. And you can see the helices or nucleic acids combined with proteins. And this is actually the machine that translates the genetic code into protein products. And so um, I'll actually show you a video. This is hot off the press. This is ongoing work in my lab that shows how... Um, so this is, this is unpublished work. It's a simulation that shows how the ribosome the machine that, it, that reads the genetic information makes proteins and how the proteins then interact with each other. And it went very quickly. But that's, that's, that reaction that you just saw is the process of translating the genetic information from two adjacent ribosomes, two adjacent factories, into the, the product, the proteins, and two of them from adjacent ribosomes interact with each other physically and go away and do their job inside the cell. So I read through and transcribed using these cell pools of notes and the patterns made speech patterns related to random words, and then I devised the rhythm. So it's not an automated structure. It's not a computer spitting out a piece of music. It's me, the composer, with all my genetic information and all my history of writing music that goes into writing this piece. So it has to do with decision-making and artistry and building a structure, but using this material. So the first, we've got some music to play from, from the premiere and also from the Eisenberg Quartet. And uh, this, this first um, example that you're going to see is the Smith Quartet at, at the premiere. And they're wearing silly hats. And I asked them to use um, the hats to show the audience 
how, as they were playing the, DVD, the music, please. they were going to move into the, the new different sets of things. watch the same um, piece of, of, of music again played by the Eisenberg Quartet and I just want you to look out so at the beginning they were wearing four different colors so we had the four bass coats happening simultaneously and then they moved and they all played um, the yellow coat and then they played the yellow and the blue so we had the C and the T together and this is the same information again switching to the C code at this point in the music. So we're looking at the C cell, the notes from that pattern. Starting to build into a new texture and it's going into the T cell now so we've got the C and the T together, slightly on circles harmony. Okay, so the next piece we're going to look at is, is, is uh, uh, just an audio file, so we don't have visuals for that. But it illustrates why I chose the string quartet, because there's so much texture and timbre and different kind of sounds that you can get. And if we're looking at the idea of genetic code having many dimensions, uh, this is a really good illustration. Um, it, it shows the, the players uh, playing on the bridge of the instrument. If any of you play a stringed instrument, it's known as sul ponticello. Uh, meets literally on the bridge and it's, it's, it creates a very glassy, icy sound that's slightly, slightly sinister and that's the T code coming in again. Okay, and the last um, audio file that we're going to listen to is from the end section of the piece, and this is the only other point in the, in the work that the four bass codes are playing together. So each of the instruments begin playing that. And I'm, I'm using this example to um, illustrate a, a fantastic um, thing that happens in the DNA um, code as it evolves. And you can see it in the number patterns. That switch, there's no preparation for it. And as Sarah said, it just switches like that. You've got a new letter, it comes into the pattern, it makes it different. And what that difference does is tell, tell the, 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 the gene to do something else. The function of the gene is different because of the switch. It's, it's modified, it's different. So I've used points of silence in the music to illustrate that. So we've got sections where um, we've got one strand, silence, another strand, silence. And I think in terms of the drama of what a switch, if we, if we could feel switches happening in our body all the time, it would be very odd, but it, it, it's, it's not tangible. But if you think about it as music, you can really see the idea of something modifying and changing and switching all the time.
but now there's a switch, so the note order is slightly different. Different again, only subtly, but it's there. settled on the one strand together. It's a big rise home. In terms of music, it's a big structural point in the piece where it's all going to the end. Okay, so including just talking what we've been discussing today about DNA and music. And I hope you heard how the patterns work and how we can interpret the ideas and maybe make you think a little bit about actually what is happening to all the patterns that are going on in, in, in me. So intuition, imagination and intrigue make for good collaboration, I think, between science and composers. And what can I offer the world of genetics? Well, for a start, the string quartet. But I believe that music can help us it can help us learn. It can broker an understanding of extraordinary thought processes and it can serve so many purposes for each of us as individuals. There's no right or wrong about music. We believe that science embracing music as a means to convey complex ideas will encourage public awareness and understanding in a meaningful way. Sarah and I are continuing our work together with further targeted research. Sarah is going to tell you how her interaction with music has affected her approach to communicating her science to the wider public. Yeah, so, so Deidre coming to my lab was, was really shockingly innovative because I think, you know, Cambridge is a place that's about 800 years old and uh, per se, you know, quite conservative, especially when you in, in the sciences. And having a composer there really, uh, I think the PhD students and postdocs and my colleagues really didn't know, know what to do initially. But over time, I think this was a, this was a brilliant process because everybody, everybody thought about their work in a completely new way because they had to communicate it to someone who didn't speak their language, who didn't understand what a biological cell is, who, you know, who didn't understand um, who didn't know what the Thousand Genomes Project was, and so on. And actually, it turns out that that's the majority of the population in our society. And so learning to communicate with, with Deidre, and by implication, learn to communicate with them, was an amazing experience. So Deidre showed the banana, but, but my father asked me about potatoes, for instance. So he didn't know whether there were genes inside potatoes. I don't know what it is about poor potatoes and vegetables and fruits and so on, but you know, the, the fact that these DNA is contained in every living thing, that's, that's something that's maybe in the, the, the next generation will understand it, but not, not necessarily everyone in the current one. And yet this is pervading our society, the healthcare system, the food industry, and so on. The, the other really important thing, apart from the communication, and also realizing that music can be a, a venue for communication, was also the application of our science. So my, my lab is extremely blue skies, extremely basic, but actually realizing that what the public is concerned about is, is, is how can this be applied, what does it mean, how can we understand it, and how can it be translated um, you know, for the benefit of, uh, in terms of healthcare and so on. I think that's also triggered me to think about ways in which my work can, can in which our discoveries can be taken from mice and so on and so forth into humans. So it's been really beneficial in terms of communication and learning how to communicate our work, which makes us understand the sort of heart of the results more clearly, I think, in a general sense, and application and translation. And just taking on that idea of application, Sarah and I are continuing to work together. 
And, and now we've got, we've got the sort of raw tools to be able to take the music into other ideas. And, and I don't feel as inhibited to, to be able to ask questions about the science because I, I know a lot more after being there for a year. But also another um, interesting side step is that I'm now implementing this, this work in a specific program in um, a, a hospital for um, very sick children in um, Toronto. It's called Holland Bloorview Hospital. And it's basically a hospital where children go to have very painful procedures several times a year. So they know that the pain's coming up. They're very young. And they have created um, a hospital waiting space with a, a wonderful colored wall that interact, they can interact with. They haven't got any music for it. So they've asked me if I would write the music. And it's, it's mostly because I've worked with this information and also because of my understanding of sensory issues to do with um, disabled children, because I have the experience of that. So it's interesting. I write concert music mostly, but working with Sarah has, has opened up a new avenue for me to be able to take the music into another context. And that's extremely positive, I think, for the music world to, to have a really purposeful interaction with the public in that way. I'll just end with a quotation from Albert Einstein, who said, all great achievements of science must start from intuitive knowledge. Imagination is more important than knowledge. I'll leave that, with that, with that thought with you. Thank you very much for listening.